for this session, it seems like I cannot automatically accept everything. So I have to just manually accept the request as it goes, comes in. So yeah, um, perhaps we can start with a little bit of feedback and discussions on like the issues you encounter or anything you don't understand while doing the exercise. If anyone would like to. So just feel free to just uh, unmute yourself and talk in Zoom. Oh, someone cannot unmute. So apparent. And we need to ask, uh, we need to ask a gym to allow people to unmute. Okay. I did it. Thanks. Um, I, um, the only comment I'd make is first of all, I appreciate you giving me all the help earlier. Um, just that, um, obviously because it's like research software at the moment, the, um, the tutorial and like the book have some quite big, like jumps between sections, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I mean, once you went through it with, with me, um, the code makes a lot of sense once it's kind of written down. Um, I just kind of found the the, um, the process of organizing my thoughts, like before writing up the code was, was quite difficult, but that might just be a me thing or it might be because it's like a, a new concept to, to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah certainly. Sorry. Oh. Anyone speaking? I just want to say, I don't think it's just a you thing. I think it's, you know, kind of a different paradigm when you're thinking about how to piece these pieces together. So I wouldn't feel like the odd one out in that regard. Yeah, I mean, this is like my first exposure to concurrency kind of properly. So um, it, it was a lot less painful than it could have been, uh, for sure. So I think, you know, the... the <clears throat> It, it could be a lot worse, especially for like a, a research tool for like experts on the on the ideas. Well, I definitely also agree about, I find it challenging to wrap my head around thinking about process, how to program thinking process instead of the normal, either functional programming or OO. But I think give it time we're going to figure out how to more efficiently program in this style. I was wondering if you could, uh, I think for me, the challenge was in understanding like how to use the, the tool or the interface, wherein you were saying that let the type system guide you and how to proceed. And I think just having, um, so means intuitively what I understood from the type system, I tried to code it up, but then I realized, okay, that's not, uh, like I need to use the system, but I don't know how to use the tool to guide me. Mm. I think just having a, a and some demo on that first would be helpful. Yeah, certainly. I think this style of programming can be new to quite a lot of you, especially if you are also new to Rust. Then this is could also be pretty challenging to learn because now you would have to learn both session types and Rust at the same time. So I, yeah, I guess that adds a bit on the challenging complexities and also in learning. But at the same time, I think, yeah, it's good to have a exercise so that like um, you can challenge how you really think about session type programming and with a actual working language or actual learning working system, then it can actually force you and guide you to actually write the correct session type program that you can actually use. Like once you once you have written this, like you can even write the other parts of the Rust application that to interact with this. And I think this is something that um yeah is hopefully can be valuable once you learn it for a while because it will take a while to um 
yeah, learn all these concepts in obviously uh, just uh, three hours, I think. A three hours tutorial session is probably not enough to cover everything. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully we can learn as much as we can. So with this uh, final session that we have. Okay, any other feedback or questions like what you don't understand? Yep. So yeah, the time errors, some of them, they can be um, a bit difficult to understand, especially with the uh, choices right now. So, so yeah. Definitely. Yep. This is part of uh, also the challenge for writing a DSL. And I think, um, is something that we can also improve as we progress. And I think part of the other challenge is also how to design Rust to also make it um, more friendly to enable these uh, different kinds of type errors. So right now we can't, we can't really have much control over the, the error messages printed by Rust. And yeah, for Haskell, there's other some traits like type errors that can help us better format our error messages so that the DSL written in Haskell, for example, they can provide some more friendly messages. But for yeah. us, you know, this is something that we are still working on. If I may as well, um, I, I've, I have used Rust before, not that much, but a little bit and um, continuation, <clears throat> sorry. Continuation passing style is quite different from how I would normally write a Rust program. Yep. So um, it definitely, in this context, it definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, but it's just not something I personally was used to when it comes to Rust. Like I've seen it in Haskell before. Um, but um, like, I mean, no, normally I would write Rust as like, kind of like C++, but with a different syntax and different kind of type system. Like, I, I don't think that, that's not a criticism of ferrite, right? That's just uh, um, like, if you, in your like book, maybe it might be a good idea to explain to people that have used Rust a lot, what or how to use continuation passing style in Rust, like effectively, because mm. it is a bit different because you have to manage like ownership and borrows and lifetimes yeah. and things like that. Um, but that's not a criticism. I think that's just like a, a comment. Yeah, sure. Definitely not a criticism. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think probably we can have a more general introduction for continuation passing style without, without fair, right? So I kind of along similar lines, one thing I'd be curious to hear is um, you know what is your advice? What is your advice on the ergonomics of approaching this style in Rust, and how do you mitigate the you know quote unquote pyramid of doom? Basically, your indentation going across your entire screen. What do you do to break things apart and flatten? What do the idioms look like that you're using uh, writing things? Basically, you know when when Suarez writes a uh, writes program in Ferrite and it's pretty, what does that look like? Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I think. That's something that we'll probably learn a bit later in this session. All right, I guess we can continue with the exercise if there's no other comments. Yeah, so I asked in Slack for some volunteers to complete exercise three to seven. And, and after that, we will go through the, the rest of the exercise, the Q exercise that Stephanie has covered in the previous lecture. That, so now we will, Later, we will try to implement the queue and check queue together. As well as finally, if there's time, we also try to go through the dining philosopher problem and talk about deadlock. And so, yeah, I think now I can pass it to the first volunteer to finish to talk about um, the exercise three, coin exchange. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's Prashant. Um, so I volunteered for this coin exchange. Um, and I think, so what I attempted to do, I've just put in the comments because I realized it's not working and I wasn't sure how to debug. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, so from the structure, 
one of the challenges that what i couldn't understand was at the bottom wait how do we do this uh, should i be navigating mm -hmm. on the screen or um you can try to edit it i think i always seeing the same screen that's uh, i think you can edit the uh, you, you you can tell me to go to the particular lines okay here yep yeah so can you see yeah so i think now we are on the same page on the same page okay yeah so uh, so these were the so i think one of the questions was okay we are including the session but afterwards from the tool that i had i wasn't sure what to start off with my inference was that okay the first task that we want to do is to send the nickel um, to the coin exchange yep and hence um, i had i'd initially done this which was send value to because my my no in what i assumed was that this nickel one is a value which we are mm -hmm. which we are obtaining yeah. um, i couldn't understand why we are interpreting it as if it's a resource okay um that's actually in the instruction here so we say that um there's the purpose of this exercise so before that we introduce like um the values in the in exercise 1 and 2 so the purpose of this uh, coin exchange exercise is to for us to think about linear resources, right? Yes, for regular Rust values, yes, you can send and receive um, Rust values using the send and receive value constructs. But these are just uh, affine values, so which means you can just um, you can just drop them later on. So what if we have some linear resource that we want to constrain in our program so that we we can ensure that we use ferrite to help ensure that it can be used linearly so the so that's why here we actually define this so we have a nickel value and dime value so this is just some dummy value that we want to keep track of and then we wrap this as a session type so we just say that a nickel is just a session type of this uh, nickel value so imagine there's some encapsulation here, but since um, we, we currently do not yet have encapsulation in ferrite, so we kind of imagine that this is just a linear resource. So we have a linear resource nickel and we have a linear resource dime. And we just try and see that these, see whether these are nickel and dimes, they are really managed as linear resources. So, so that's the idea. And if you see here, so the coin exchange is an exchange that um, does um, receive the nickel channel, right? So it's not receiving the nickel value because like these are just dummy values. Um, okay. So we are just, the types that we're interested in is these are linear types, which is nickel and dime. And so, yeah, the coin exchange is re received two nickels and it sends back a dime. All, all of these are receive channel and send channel. So, so yeah, that's, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So I think, um, so what we're saying is we send channel two, we send coin exchange and we send nickel one, two coins, yeah. right? But then yep. at the same time, then the next thing that we wanted to do, which was the continuation of it, would have yes. been we are sending to coin exchange nickel two. That's right. Uh, but after this, uh, after this, will... you will get back a dime. So yes. you want to receive the channel. So I was saying, shouldn't I wait? Are you typing something? Yes. I, I was talking about should I wait? Mm -hmm. Um, no, wait you only need to if, wait if the in the final step when everything is terminating. Okay, but uh, why? Why I, I assume that whenever we are receiving, we should be waiting for the reception. Whenever you are, like right now, I'm expecting to receive a dime, so I assume yes. that I need to wait for the process to do the computation and then send me the dime. That's right. So you 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 say you want to receive from the coin exchange. And you receive it just like you want to receive a value. So you, you say receive. So that's this construct. Maybe I can share here. I think so there's the construct um, receive. So
so you have the send, ch send channel and receive channel, right? Yes. So for the case of send channel, so this is the provider rule. So we want to send a channel from the linear context to the pro as an output. So this is the value output. And as for the client, you want to receive the channel from. So if, if F is a F is outputting channel A1 and then continue as A2, right? So you want to receive from F and then you assign this output channel A1 to A and then you continue as K. Okay. And the continue, so this is also in continuation passing style. So you receive channel from, and then you say which channel you want to receive from. So like in our cases, we want to receive the channel from coin exchange. Yeah. And then in our continuation, we will get the, the, the new coin, the dime as the, in our, our callback. Yes. So I think that's, that's what I had, as, I had written up. So can you see that? I'm not sure I can't. Mm -hmm. It seems like I don't see anything here. Oh. It's the shared, is this a uh, session not working? Okay, wait. Yeah, I think I can just, it yeah. Yep. Sorry for that. Yep. So it should be send channel two. Oh, still. Um, um, no, we're sending value and receive from, right? Receive yeah, channel. so we want to receive from. Um, and we, we, yep. So let's, let's just pause here first and you just move the, let's move the to do inside. So yeah, let's try a to do here and try to compile a program, right? And I think there's probably some mismatch in the bracket. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so, so now I just save and you can see like there's a error here, right? Um, so basically here is saying that you, the use of send value two is uh, not exactly correct because like, we are this nickel, as we say, is a channel. So it should be, um, we cannot send it as a value. Instead, we want, we want, we are supposed to be sending a channel to coin exchange, right? Okay, yes. yes. Um, so, sorry, I, th I thought I had made that change. No problem. So if we go to the, yeah. And so I think now there's no problem that we can continue. And so just to make the screen easier, let's just have a new line. Yep, we can continue here. Okay, and but yeah. So from here, can you tell me how to use this tool to guide on what do we decide to do with the dime? Because I need to be sending mm -hmm. this dime to the uh, to the uh, the vending machine. That's right. Um, so you can see the vending machine, the session type of the vending machine is that it should be receiving a dime. And then it will send the drink as a, just a regular Rust value. Okay, so I can I can say uh, send channel to. Yes. And I will say the vending machine. Mm -hmm. um, I need to send the dime. Yes. Uh, and the continuation is, to, yes, continuation is to wait. Um, let's just put a to-do first. Uh, and then remove the semicolon. Okay. Yeah, and we'll try to safely and run it. So now there's no type errors, right? So for the vending machine, we can see the session type here. So it's sending a web. The vending machine after it's received a dime channel, you try to send a value. So you try to send a drink as a value. So since the vending machine is sending a value, here we want to receive a value from the vending machine. Okay. Um, let's put it at a separate line since the screen space is a bit limited. Yeah. 
So we want to receive a value. So now we'll get the drink as a value. So by the way, I just keep for simplicity, right? Let's just pretend, pretend that the drink is a, just a, a fine value so that we can, we can choose to not drink it, but money is important, we must spend it. Okay. Right. Yeah. So this so is- we receive a value um, and we can, yes. And I think we had to terminate after this, right? Yep. So now, so now we have to um, we have to wait for the other processes that we still have in our linear context to terminate first before we can terminate. So if you follow the types, so you you know that the nickel has been sent to the coin exchange, right? Yes. And the dime has been sent to the vending machine. So all these channels they are already empty. So, but the coin exchange and the vending machine, they are still running. So we have to wait for the coin exchange to terminate and we have to wait for the vending machine to terminate before we can terminate ourselves. So how do we see that from the type? Like if, so, I, write, if I write here to do. Yeah, can, so. Uh, can you show me? Sure. So right now it's a little bit more difficult, but since we have quite a bit of linear resources. So right now this, um, by the way, this string, we can't really print it. So we just say print, drink. So we just ignore the value. Since like this is just a dummy value. So we, we just receive the drinks. And here we want to see like, okay. So right now the drawing compiles, but we don't really know what's inside. So we say that we say to do as partial session, right? So this is this what we have inside the partial session, right? And we know that at the end we want to terminate, but we don't know what we are we have inside the linear context, right? So we can say H list, right? Or actually here we just replace it with a unit first. No, actually we can't replace it. Let's say like we just have an invalid type, right? So if we say that okay, this is an invalid type because like the partial session should be a list, but n is not a context, right? And here, actually, I think this is probably not true. So let's just use this each list and um, just say, let's pretend that our linear context only has one list, right? One value. So what does it say? Yeah. So we can see kind of there's a, so here we, we kind of see that the error message here say that we expect a linear context. So the type here saying that we are supposed to have a linear context with only one channel, but actually we have a linear context with um, multiple channels, right? So we have the first one is have the session type N, the second, second, channel has the session type N, the third, fourth, and fifth, they are empty, so we can ignore. So the first and second is actually here, right? So the first time we exchange, so the Z, so this is the coin exchange, and this is the vending machine. And these two, they have not been terminated. So if you see the session type, so we from the vending machine, right? So we have already received the, it has already received a channel the dime and then it sends the drink, but now the is terminating. So we want to wait for the vending machine to terminate before we terminate, right? So we can do that here. Um, do you know how to continue? No? I don't, I don't. Can you show? Okay. Yeah. So what we should do, so we just remove the to-do, right? So we can say wait and then wait for coin exchange to terminate, right? So then we, we can do something, right? So, so here you can see that this compiles. So I'll wait for coin exchange to terminate, it works. So we know that we can do something else, right? But the vending machine is still not empty, right? it's still terminating. So we have to wait as well for the vending machine to terminate. So we just write this and then we just use to do again to see like whether it works. 
So until this point, you can see it works, right? So um, we, we say we want to wait for this and then it, it compiles. So it means that this point exchange is terminating and we have successfully wait for it. And then finally, we just need to do something. So we so here we just think to terminate. Then the whole session will just compile. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I think there are some questions in the chat. And someone raised me. This phone is a bit small. It's mostly just a lot of discussion, but Joe is asking to uh, go first with exercise five before four. Five before four, okay. All right, then, then after, if there's no more discussion on this one, then we can move to five. So um, is there any more questions for, for this? So by the way, so after you write your program or while you are writing, it's also good to use the couple, the formatter. So we just use cargo. So in the bottom here on the terminal, we just say cargo format. And you can see like if you just uh, format our code to the standard uh, formatting rules provided by Rust. And this tends to be um, make it more easier to read. So it, it tries to separate everything up down to separate lines and usually this can improve some readability as well. Okay, I think we have one more hour left. So any questions for this exercise, coin exchange? Okay, I hear nothing. So let's go to the ATM then. So we um, have the, yes. Are you gonna go through it or? Uh... Who would like to do it? Maybe I should do it because I've got it pretty fresh in my memory. Okay. Um, uh, so if I, Go to the ATM. Oh. So if I make a change like here, yeah, yeah, okay, you are seeing that excellent. Okay, so um, this one we've got kind of, we've got two main functions to implement. Um, and uh, I think we'll start with the, the client because it's, um, it's a little bit simpler. Um, and so when Juarez is talking about using the type system to guide what you're doing, I mean, the simplest example, right, is that here, uh, it, it's a session receive channel. So the first thing we want to do is, is receive a channel, um, which I'm just gonna call Pan. Um, and the first thing that that's going to do is it's going to have a type of ATM. And if I highlight that, which you can't see, um, but if, if you highlight that, it, it tells you that that's just a, an alias for um, receiving a value. Um, or in this case, because we're the client, we're going to be sending a value. So what we're going to do is we're going to do send value to, and we're going to send it to the channel we've just received. And the first value we need to send is going to be the pin. Because if we go up to the ATM provider, um, you'll see here it says internal choice pin result if you highlight the ATM. And then if you go up uh, all the way to the types at the top, um, you can see the defined choices, which tell you that the pin result then receives a value which takes you to a withdrawal result. So um, it's on line like 73 to 77 and 79 to 82. So that's, I think it was a good example of like following the types. Um, so we're sending a value to the provider, in which case we're gonna send a pin. And then for the continuation, we will um, be, uh, we're gonna have to make a choice here between whether the pin is correct or it's not. So the, uh, the we're gonna use a macro which is case and we do the case on the channel. 
Uh, and we have two options, either the pin is okay, um, or uh, we've got the wrong pin. Um, and then you can put, uh, do in both of those. So we'll go to the ATM provider now, and we're going to be, we want to receive that value that was sent by the client. So we're going to do receive value. And this was a tip as well that I got given, which is that to avoid like lifetime issues, we want to do a move on closure um, so that we can move it kind of into the body of the continuation. And because we can just interact with like regular Rust structures, uh, we, can, we can just use like an if statement. So if the received pin is equal to the actual pin, we're going to do something. And otherwise, uh, we're going to do something else. But we're going to do that one first because it's much simpler. So we're going to, we've been asked to print. So I'm just going to say um, pin provided is incorrect. Or something like that. And then we will offer a case, which means that the result uh, in the client that we're splitting on um, it's going to receive that result from this um, from the provider's channel. So we're going to offer a case, and in this case, it's wrong pin, and we're just going to terminate the provider because um, if there's no if, if the pin isn't correct, there's no point. We can't provide anything, so we just want to terminate uh, right away. Um, Okay, so that's what happens if we get the wrong pin. So if we get the wrong pin here in the client, we're just going to, um, we, we can't terminate the client until the provider has terminated. So what we do is we wait on the channel and then we're going to terminate. And so this, this wait construct just means we're gonna wait for like the termination signal from the provider and then we're gonna terminate ourselves because I believe the uh, type system it doesn't let us drop the client until the provider's already been, been dropped. Um, now, if the pin is okay, what do we want to do? Well, the provider is going to need to know um, what the amount we're being asked to withdraw is. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to offer a case. And in this instance, we're going to say, right, well, the pin is okay. Now we're going to block and we want to receive the amount. So we're going to do another move closure. And if the amount is less than or equal to the balance, we're going to do one thing. So I'm going to put it to do there. Otherwise, we're going to do another thing here. Now, this only matters um, if we can actually receive the amount. So let's go back to the client and we'll say, well, the, when the pin is okay, um, the thing we're going to need to do is we're going to send to the provider, we need to send the withdrawal amount. So again, that is on the channel that we defined earlier. And the amount we're sending is the withdrawal amount, which, yeah. Then we're going to do something. And I'm gonna leave this for now because it was one of the more complicated parts of the, um, the code with, with to do with, with uh, this next bit. So we'll go back to the provider because we, we can basically finish up uh, the provider now. So, um, the pin is okay. We've received a value amount, uh, which is on line 114. And if the amount is less than the balance, uh, we've been asked to show the user, like, you know, we're going to withdraw uh, a certain amount from the account, and the remaining balance is a search. 
So that's just a, a print line. Um, line, and that's fine. And then what we need to do is we're going to then uh, have to let the client know that the withdrawal is okay. So we're going to offer another case, um, which was withdrawal. withdraw okay. And then, and this was something that actually I think I would need explain to me again. We've got these two helper functions. And in this case, we are going to be doing the spend cash helper function. Um, actually, no, we're going to do the forge cash first, which is basically, a, I think, a, a linear context transfer of the, the data. Um, so we're going we're gonna to use the forge cash here um, first. So what we need to do is we need to include that session and because it is a function, uh, we're going to talk, do forge cash amount. And then again, we've got a, um, a closure, uh, which in this case, I'm going to call the cash channel. So that's the channel via which we're sending the result of this function. And what we're going to do is we're going to just send uh, the forge cash from the cash channel. So Channel. from cash channel. And once that's done, this particular branch is kind of completed. We're just sending the, the cash uh, through that channel. Um, if the amount is not valid, so if amount is um, greater than the balance, then we're just going to say, you know, um, requested amount greater than the balance, and the case we need to offer, which again, if you just follow the types, uh, if we go up, the other option is insufficient fund, and the only kind of member of that is just an end. So we'll just say, we'll offer the case of insufficient fund, and then we'll terminate. Um, making sure I've got the right punctuation. So now I'm gonna hop back to the client and, and it is interesting how we kind of bounce back and forth. Um, so I think I've completed the provider. Yes, so now we just need to finish up the client. So the client has just sent the withdrawal amount um, to the provider. And the provider has sent one of two cases back. So we're going to do another case macro uh, on the channel. And the two options are um, withdraw OK, which we'll do something in, and insufficient fund. And with insufficient fund, all we're going to do is um, we're just gonna wait until the provider has terminated and then terminate ourselves because nothing else happens. So we're just waiting for that print statement and then we're gonna close down the session. Um, so the withdraw okay. Um, if we look up at the provider, the thing we're doing is sending a channel on line 120. So here, the, the correct thing to include uh, is to receive the channel and we're receiving it from the provider which uh, the channel we've named there is was Chan on 148 and the thing that we're receiving um, I'm going to call the cash channel um, I'm sure there's like better naming but um, and again we have to we're going to be calling another um, another helper function. In this case, we're calling the spend cash function. So again, we need to include another session, I think. Um, and that session is spend cash. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna call that channel, the spender channel. Now, what we need to do is we need to take the cash channel. So the, um, the forge cash, like the linear, the linear typed context, um, we need to send that to the spender. So we're going to do a send channel 
two. And the destination is the first argument. And the source is the second argument. And finally, we have one more continuation. So here um, on line 157, oh, I think I've missed something. I think here there's a there's the bracket, missing bracket. Ah, uh, yes, yes, you're absolutely right. So here on line 157, um, the the forge cache session um, has been sent to the spend cache session. So the client itself doesn't have to do anything else. Um, instead, we just need to now wait for all of the, um, the providers to close. And again, there's a nice wait macro, which is wait all. And um, by the way, you know, I didn't come up with all this myself, so as to help um, give me pointers. Um, we can give that just like a, a, an array of channels. So we have the this uh, chan, we have to wait for that to terminate. And we also have to wait for the spend cash function to terminate. So we, we say that that channel needs to terminate and then we can terminate ourselves. Now, um, if I do work, I don't know how that works. Um, uh, but, ooh, we've got an unreachable code on the send channel two. Um, have I missed something there? I think there's probably some out of sync or something. I think, yeah. I think. Mm. If, if we just try cargo. Um, I saw a failure to save. Be careful. You might want to copy stuff out just in case you get stepped on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems to build just fine if I run it from here. Um, yeah. yeah, excellent. There we go. Um, it should be. Yes. So, appearing at the, the bottom of the screen. It looks like you're in just fine. Um, yeah, it looks like it works. So um, basically the, the thing that really helped, it did help was the, um, I, I found it very, at first, very confusing kind of, it, it felt a bit like clients and providers were kind of um, swapped around, but it, it actually does make sense when you think about it from a, dropping channels perspective, you have to drop the provider first. Um, and once I kind of, once that clicked, it made a lot more sense kind of when something was a provider versus when it was a client. Um, and when it came to kind of following the types around, um, kind of a lot of the names of the types correspond to directly to like some functions or macros. So especially like, internal choice, if you're a provider, you offer a case. And if you're a client, you split on a case. Um, receiving a channel, um, which it says in say the, um, or receiving a value, for example, in the pin okay um, type, um, we want to receive a value. So we do just receive a value um, right away. So, it was really useful to kind of split the editor open and, and say, well, I'm going to be receiving a value or receiving a channel. So the function I'm going to call is, is probably a good idea to try receive underscore value or receive underscore channel. Um, but at the same time, um, I definitely think the biggest challenge was kind of just getting my head around kind of you, you want to you want to put to do's in the I wanted to put to do's in the right spot and then just jump between the two the client and the provider and I was I was struggling when I was focusing on just doing one at a time um, uh, so like you know obviously I you know I got some help in the end but it, it did make a lot of sense when it all started clicking together um, but it is definitely a different style of, of development. Uh, in fact, if you don't know any Rust, it might actually be easier to start writing in Ferrite than if you do know Rust, because the continuation passing style and the jumping between the two functions is just a bit different. Um, but I'm sure, obviously, Suarez can 
Charles can explain kind of exactly what's going on here a bit better than I can. Um, Cause you know, I mean, he, he wrote the, <laughs> he wrote the library. Uh, oh, but excellent. Like I, I, I think you, you have done also a very amazing job at, at explaining the whole program and you are able to actually live quote the whole session. I think this is kind of beyond my expectation. So I think it's actually a very good case that you are, you are actually able to do that after just, uh, just I don't know, one, one or two hours or a few hours of um, tutorials learning. And, and this, this is actually already a pretty complicated program. So I'm, I'm actually very happy that you, you are able to do that and be able to present that at the same time. And, and that is kind of, um, showing a good, pretty, pretty good progress for the tutorial session, I think. So, yeah. It was actually really easy to uh, understand your thought process, Joe, and the way you chase the uh, walk through chasing the types is actually really cool. It's very, very easy to follow. Yeah, your, your way of explaining is also very good. Excellent. So is there any other questions for this exercise? Let me see there's some charts. Okay, um, if no questions, then let's move on to the next exercise, which is exercise four. So. Yeah, well, I will explain to you guys what I've done for this exercise. So basically this, um, for this exercise, we're supposed to, oh, can you guys see my mouse scrolling? I don't see it. Um, yeah, so I'm, do you want to share your screen? Oh, okay. Um, maybe if you want to share your screen, then I can stop sharing mine. Well, I cannot. It's disabled. Huh. Multiple. I'm not co-host, so you'll have to enable her. Yeah, I think all participants. Maybe now. Okay, all participants. Does it work now? No. I turned it on. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thanks. So share screen. Ah, yeah, awesome. Which one is that? It's uh, the center. Okay, can you guys see it? We see it, yes. Good. Yeah, so basically we want to implement a calculator which will do addition and multiplication. So in the beginning of the code, we have the, the choice be defined as one operation, okay, the calculator op, ops. One is addition, one is multiplication. So I, my thought was for the calculator provider, I will have to provide offer choice for those two options. And one is add where we get input X, Y, and we send back X plus Y, one is multi application where we get to input and send back uh, the result of the multiplication. And that part, I think it's pretty straightforward, but then I wasn't sure how to use, use sessions to actually complete the calculator, calculating process. Mm -hmm. So, for the use of the calculator, um, if you see the type signature, um, the receive value is receiving two values, but it's actually queried as a single receive value. So both the X and Y, they are sent as a tuple instead of um, a separate receive value. Oh, it's a tuple. Wow. Yeah, wasn't yeah. paying attention to the yeah. type so, signature. So I originally meant for this to be more simplified. That's why I put it as a tuple. So of course you can also write it as a, the, the, the session type can be just a receive value in TJS32 and then another receive value. So, but for the case of this is a receive value of a tuple of integers. So maybe you can just have one receive value. Hmm. I see. Well, do you mind taking over? Wasn't sure how to yeah, proceed yeah. with so this. Just, just, you can just edit it. I, I'm, I'm also looking at my screen. So 
So by the way, you can just uh, destructure the tuples inside the inside the closure. So if you don't mind, so I think you can do like X and Y. So this will just uh, um do you, is the screen updated? Oh, I think are you on the are you on hmm. the live session? So maybe you're not. I think I wasn't. Yeah, I think on the right editor. Sorry. <laughs> I think it's a, the, the, a different session. Yeah. So, so there's a, the OPLSS session. Oh, okay. This one? Yeah. So right. Yep. Yeah. So, so you can see like on, on line 31, there's the receive value move, and then you can just destructure it X and Y. Mm -hmm. So this is how you receive a tuple of two values. So which means I should remove. Yeah. So you just I'm not to sure how it. to organize this. Yeah, and then we just need to match the closing braces and brackets. I'm pretty sure I'm missing a bracket. Yeah. So so here, here is the opening bracket. And so, and this is the open. So this is the opening brace and this is the final bracket. So there should be some bracket around here, right? So this is the final bracket. And so mm -hmm. there's a brace here. Like okay, here. yeah. Yeah, so let's see. Yes, I think so. And also here, the final line, there's a extra brace. So we can remove that. Okay, that looks much better. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, we, then we also need to fix the line 35 to 37 in the same way. Right? Correct. Yeah. So if I do this, save this I think it should work yes so and then here uh, we we don't need to declare this so we can kind of just remove this part oh yeah or well, actually if you don't want you can also like just have a semicolon here and you just return provided at the last line oh okay yeah I think this is Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure why it's still highlighting errors in the site. Looks like I'm still complaining about something. Oh, I think you can probably just uh, mismatch types. Oh, I think it's a O error. So if you try and save, it should refresh. Right. Okay, so, saved. Yeah. If you just click save. Or we can just run it here. Couple build uh, bin zero four simple calculator. So yeah, there should be no errors. It, it actually built successfully. If you see the terminal at the bottom, right? Mm. It's probably some some issue with the which is still cool, but. Otherwise, we can also just return it directly. So this part can be removed and the semicolon can be removed. All right. So maybe I should do it. Sure. Yeah, just like this. So yeah, I think the, the program works. I'm not sure why it's still showing error on your side. But maybe we can go to the main session. So line 46, we can try to do implement line 46. So now we have two instances of the calculator. 
also have C1 and C2. Yep. Um, so we want to say, we want to calculate three plus four times five, let's see. So we will multiply four and five first, right? Is that hard coded? Sorry? The hard coded three? Yeah, yeah. Multiply yeah. Four. So, so yeah, the exercise is just a simple calculation. So you just uh, try to send the, so you try to use the first calculator to compute four times five. And then mm. you get the result and then you use it to add three to it. I see. Yeah. Well, to do that, do I use apply channels? Um, no need, because right now we already include the session. So if you see like line 44 and 45, okay. we added two instances of the calculator provider into our linear context. So which means at line 46, um, we already have two channels. We have C1 and C2. And both of them have the session type calculator. Right. Yeah. So, so you, we can just interact with the first calculator to, to calculate four times five. So, um, so. Yeah. So the first thing you do is that you want to do something with C1, right? And, and the calculator operations, it allows you to choose what operation you want to do. Since the calculator is allow, giving us two options, right? So we want to choose either addition or multiply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a choose macro for us to choose the operation from a channel. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm looking up <laughs> okay. which macro I should use. Oh, choose. Yeah. So, oh. choose. So basically you can say choose. I'm writing it in the comment. So you can say write choose and then your channel, right? And then on the branch, so like number mouth and then something, right? So that'll be yeah. C1. A sigma will be addition. Yeah, so you can choose either the add or mount. Yep. And so, the, so the continuation, we can just uh, fill in, we can just replace it with to do for now and see whether it, this is correct. Yeah, so just removing the first explanation. Yeah, it's just to do exclamation, right? And then bracket. So, yeah. So, and then you hit save and it should work. Yeah. Yeah, so, so now it shows that it works. So we can just uh, modify it. So now we can replace to do. So since we have already chosen the mount branch, so we know that the provider is, wants to receive two integer values, right? You want to receive mm -hmm. a tuple. So, so then we, we need to send something to the provider, right? So, so we, we want to send two numbers to the provider. So the construct we can use is the send value two. Yeah. Quick half hour warning, just so you know. Oops. Definitely keep going, this is valuable. Yeah, so, so let's remove the exclamation mark. 
since we're using just the function. So we send value to C1. How is it going? Oh, sorry. So we, I can bring up the type signature of the same value to function? Um, yeah, I think you can. So if you remove this and if you hover, if you hover to send value two, it should, it should have a, yeah, so although the, the signature is a bit complicated, so so there's a there's inside the reference, so in the slides and the, in the Fairlight book, there's a description that provides a simpler explanation on how to use this. So I, yeah. That's right. I guess for the interest of time, maybe we can. Yeah, maybe you can. I can show you and do it together. And then we will go through the final few shared example. Yeah, so yeah, I can show you. So, so what you need to do is you just say send value two and then you choose C1, right? And then we want to send two values. So we want to send four times five, right? And then we want to, to do, Maybe now I can just share my screen, so. Yeah, I can stop sharing. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for the, thanks for trying out. Um, if you like, maybe we can also have another Zoom session later to continue offline. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, hopefully that will help. Okay, so I, now we are back to my screen. So what we do is that we want to send a value to send this four and five, right? And then we will try to receive something from it, right? So we want to receive the value also from C1 because now C1 is uh, just sending the result back, right? So we just move and then we get the result. Um, let's call it Z, right? And then here we just say to do and see whether it works. So now we can see that um, there's no errors, right? So we have gotten the answer. This answer is in Z and you can see like Z is an integer, right? So this is an integer and we gotten our first integer, which is the result four times five, which should be 20. And we want to add three to it. So what we do is that we use our second, second channel, our second calculator instance, so, which we do choose again, but this time we are doing C2, right? So we want to choose C2 and we want to choose the addition, right? So now it works. So we can choose from C2 that we want to do addition. And then to do addition, we also need to send the value to it because the provider is expecting us to, expecting to receive something. So we can say send value two and then C2. And then we send the result. So we send Z and also we want to send three, right? Z plus three. And then this also like, once again, we use to do and then see now it works. So we send the value to it. And also now this branch is also the same. You will send back the result, right? So we just say receive value from C1. And then now we get our final result, right? And then here we once again see whether it works. So, oh, oh, because, so you can see like, here's why, why like adding, writing step-by-step step would help because you can see like in this case, I forgot, I, I used the wrong channel because I'm supposed to receive from C1, but now I'm C2, but now I'm receiving from C1. So of course, like this doesn't work. So if I write this, then I immediately get an error. So I know that 
this is the step that I have some made some mistake. So I just change it to C2. And then now there's no error, right? And then now I can do something, right? So I can print nine, and then we just print the result. And then once again from birth, if I try to terminate now, I'll get an error because like the linear context is not empty. So C1 and C2, they are both now in their final state. So we can use the wait all, right? We'll wait for C1 and C2 to terminate. And then finally, we ourselves terminate. And now this whole thing compiles. And we can run this, right? I'll go run bin. And so, yeah, so you can see like it prints out the result. Cool, and thank you. Yeah, hopefully this makes sense. I think we probably will take some more exercise to wrap the head around. So basically, um, yeah, the way you do it is you do it step by step and figure out by look at looking at the signatures. Any questions? Nope, chat has been pretty quiet. In terms of how to use the remaining time, David was volunteered on number six and had some good stuff there. And that one does recursive types. So that might be good to look at. Uh, but I know you wanted to do the queue and other stuff too. So it's yeah. your fault. Yeah, unfortunately, I think we run out of time, so we, so we probably, we probably cannot do this exercise. So I'll just try to cover the few last few content, and then um, probably just wrap up by just showing the answer, right? Sounds so, good. Yeah. So last uh, yesterday we have already covered the shared session type, and here we will just see look a bit on how the shared session type works. So, and also maybe just go through a little bit on the um, recursive session types, right? So for recursive session types, the issue is that for Rust, we don't really have a way to define recursive type alias. So for example, let's say we have an infinite counter that we want to just keep sending a, a integer that is keep increasing. We have, the way we have to write it is that we want to send a value, right? So A1 is equal to send value U64. And originally we are supposed to want to go back to A1. So, but instead of writing A1 equals send value with U64, A1, that is not allowed in Rust. So instead we write Z. And this is a hint for that is for the first recursion. So the zero of recursion. So we want to go back to the original, original, original type. So so in this final form is that we use this recursive, which is kind of this, um, if you know about the term level recursion, the term level fixed point, then this is the type level fixed point. So you have the type level fixed point, this rec, that is going to bind this Z to back to itself. So, so then here we have a counter session that we have this rec that binds Z. So it is going to be keep sending the value and we use this fixed session to just um, send the value, right? And then we recurse back to itself. So you can see we have a counter and then we have call counter again to recurse back to itself because like after we, this fix is basically unfolding it. So inside here, inside this, uh, inside this continuation, it becomes this send value U64 and then this uh, the whole types of A1 gets unfolded. So it becomes rec again. So then after you send a value to offer the same session, we just uh, call this function again and it will generate a new session for us. So similarly for unfixed session, we just uh, have to specify the, the channel that we want to unfix. And then we can also do the similar thing of on unfixing it. And now we'll just go through the, quickly go through the more interesting case, which is shared session types, right? So if you recall the types, we have the accept shared session, which is actually, uh, it is, it has a, it has a linear session. So it has a linear continuation, but the return, the conclusion is actually a shared continuation. So if you see the types, it accepts a session A1, A2, 
And then the return value is a shared session is instead of, of, of a partial session that we know of. So this shared session is used to represent a shared ferrite program. So a shared session type program. And similar to the recursive session types, we also have a recursion points, which is this release. And what we do is that uh, we, when we have these uh, types, we will replace this release with back to the original types plus this uh, shared to linear, linear to shared. Because if, if you look at the type signature, you know that inside the, this shared to linear, you, when we define a when we define a shared session type, it's always starting with a linear to shared. And at the end, it's always a shared to linear. And then, and then it follows by a linear to shared to go back to the original session type. So we use this release type to um, unfold the whole thing by this. So the example here is this, right? So if we A1 is the type send value U to send value U64 and then release, then after, after you accept it, so after you accept a session of this type, so A1 is this. So if, if A1, so you want to offer a shared session type of the type linear to shared and then send value U64 release. And if you accept it, then inside your continuation, you have to offer a linear session type. So now it's a linear session type of type send value U64. And then we will replace the release. So it becomes linear to shared and it becomes shared to linear again and back to the original type. So this is the type level recursion that we have. So similarly for detached shared session. So when we detach, you can see like for a except shared session, our continuation is a linear, linear program and our conclusion is a shared program. For detach, our continuation is a shared session. So we want to recurse back. And the result program is a session. So it's a linear session. So this is the, the thing about switching between the shared and linear layer. And also, um, if you see that um, the partial session is uh, represented as a program, that's not yet been executed. So for shared session, it's also the same. So maybe I will, I missed an example. So yeah, this is an example of a shared session type program. So we have a shared counter that you want to send, keep sending a value, right? So when you acquire the counter, you can get back a value from this shared provider, but there can be now, since this is a shared session type, it means that there can be many clients that tries to get this counter get the count value from the share counter and it will work across multiple clients. And the way we write it is just this simple recursion. So we just say accept shared session and then we send the value. And then we say detach. And when we, after we detach, our continuation is we go back to the share counter again. So this, this is a very simple form of recursion. And also note that uh, Ferret also enforced the acquisition constraint that we have discussed yesterday which means that it is actually uh, invalid if you define a shared session to, for example, if you replace this release with an end, so you say that I just send a value and then I terminate, it's actually not valid. I should also catch these errors and it will not allow you to define such a sh shared session type program. So we say that um, the shared session is a, it's just a program. So when you define this, so after, if you call this, it's not actually generating a shared process. So here we are just defining a program and it's not yet been executed. When you want to execute it, we call this run shared session function. And what we get back is a shared channel. So this is the actual Rust object that represents a link to the underlying shared uh, process endpoint that has been spawned by this run shared session. So after we call this, then there will actually be a process that's running as a async task in the background. And you can use this shared channel to acquire it. And for the world, for the case of the shared counter, you can try to read the values from it. So for, for the example here, we have the shared counter, right? 
and we say we just say run shared session on this and then we get back a single shared channel. And this means that um, even though like from both here, we can see that every, every time you call this is returning a shared session, but when we, when we actually run it, there's only a single shared process. So when we say the only shared process that's running, there's only one of them and is, is, uh, is uh, alias to this uh, counter channel. Right. And, and so this counter channel is actually a clonable, clone, clonable channel. So it's, which means that you can use the Rust uh, clone method to create multiple copies of it. So, so this is what, so this is the one that is different. So with a linear session, with a linear channel, you must use it exactly once. But for a shared channel, it's just like a regular Rust value, but it's clonable. So you can use it zero time, you can use it one time, or you can use it many times. So, so it's unrestricted basically. So for the client side, um, the way we do it is that we get this shared channel object. So the, the shared process, it has to be spawned and run behind the background at somewhere first. Then after that, you can receive this shared channel as an object, uh, as a just a regular Rust value. So in we call that in the CUR, uh, not in the CUS, right? Um, when you want to receive and send the shared channel, there's a, there are special construct. But in fair, right, the shared channels, they are just regular Rust values. So you can actually receive, you can actually send the shared channel just as a send value, or you can receive a shared channel as receive value. And after you get this uh, shared channel in through some way, you can use this acquire shared session inside your session type program. And you can have a continuation that acquires a linear acquires a linear linear copy of it and after the after the release so so um yeah so so the way we see it is here right so let's say we have a set a1 and send value to u64 right and if we have a shared channel of type linear to shared and then send value u64 release then after we acquire it inside our linear context if you have the this new channel that's appended to the end of the linear context with the type send value u64 and then linear to shared and then shared to linear and then back to the original type. So similarly for re release, like um, after you interacting, finish interacting with the linear critical section in the shared session type, you can you, you will need to release the shared channel, the, the linear, linear part of the shared channel so that the shared channel can be acquired again by some other process. And so here is an example of the counter client, right? So we just create a linear program that is when it's given a shared channel, you can just acquire this counter, right? And after that, we receive from it, and then we just release the shared session so that other, other linear process can also acquire it. So at this point, any questions on how shared session type works? Nothing yet. Okay, so we'll just go for the last 10 minutes, I guess we'll just go through um, very go through very quickly for the two tutorial, last two tutorial exercise. So we have a shared queue and we have the dining philosopher. So this shared queue, I actually we, we get it from the the you can actually refer it from the paper, the manifest train with session types. There's exam an example on how shared queue works. And Stephanie also have already explained how we can write such a shared queue program. So we can try to write implement this inside our, our inside ferrite, right? If you want so, to look at some code, Grant actually shared his implementation and it should be in the workspace. Ah, okay. So do you want to explain it? Who is it this uh, one? That was the linear queue, not the shared one. Ah. I did not try the shared yeah. one. <laughs> Sorry, wrong one. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think we are already running out of time. So we probably don't have much time to explain. So by the way, um, but so I, I'll just give a quick summary of it. 
So we, we already know that for the shared queue, um, we want to model. So there are actually many ways to model the shared queue. But so to keep it to the original example, we just uh, follow the original example that we we structure this queue as a chain of shared process. So which means for each queue, node of the queue, we actually have a shared process that is running. So we have multiple shared process. And we start with the empty queue, which is a shared process that is just um, offering nothing, right? And we have an element queue that has some element on the head and is linked through this shared channel to another, another pro shared process that is uh, offering the tail element. Right, and and so this is how we uh, represent it on the. So I probably just use the answer, right? So this is how we represent it on the on in fair, right? So we say that a queue is just a linear to share, and then it's an external choice with some operation, right? So we have an Q and a DQ. And for DQ, we have a case. So if we want to DQ, it may there may be some value, or that the the queue may be empty. Which in this case, we will just release, right? So you can see at each branch of this, there must be a release instead of n. So you must always recurse back to ensure the acquisition constraint. So for the case of empty queue, right? We Oh, by the way, so the other thing is that um, the difference from the original example is that we just have our elements as a regular Rust values. So the queue itself is a shared process, shared, shared session type, but um, the elements is a, just a regular Rust value. So this is simplifying a bit. So for NQ, you receive a string value, and for heat, if there's uh, some elements, then you just send the string value, right? So the case for the case of empty queue, we just say that we accept this shared session, right? And, and for the case of end queue, we will receive the value and then we detach the shared session by going back to the head queue. So, so this is the alum. So this, this function. So the head queue is actually taking, taking, the, the, taking the process and then and then spawning up a new session, right? Um, yeah. So here you can see um, we have a detach and then we have a run shared session. So this is, this is kind of like we just spawn a new process, right? So we just spawn a new process that's acting as the empty queue. And then, and then we have a hit, which is this value that is uh, acting as the hit of the queue. So this is also a shared session, but it's linked to another shared process. So to run this, we also use accept shared session, right? And then once again, like if we want to end queue again, so this is a little bit complicated because like we have a few, we, we want to do some recursion and we want to reconstruct a queue. So we have to like acquire, we, we have to acquire the tail. So because like when we end queue, we want to end queue it to the end of the, process. So we have to delegate this to the tail process. So we have to acquire it. So we have to acquire this process and then we just clone it. So, and then we choose and queue, then we forward the, the value to the tail of it. For the case of the queue, it's pretty simple because like, we, just, um, we just say that we have this element, so we just send the value to it. And then we use this special shared forward construct so that we can forward the um, forward the value back. So it's actually this I didn't cover this just now. So there's a shared forward rule. They're saying that if you have a you already if you already have a linear channel. So by the way, I use this bar here to indicate that this is a Rust. This is a Rust value. So if you already have a Rust channel, uh, a shared channel of this shared session type S, then your shared forward is just um just offering this shared to the linear, right? Because you're just offering, you, you just continue, you just ask another shared process to, to handle the remaining requests. So yeah, so that's, that's how I do it. And so like, if you want to enqueue, if you want to acquire, if you want to enqueue something, the way you do it is that you just acquire it, right? And then you just choose enqueue and then you send value to it. 
for DQ, you just acquire, and then you choose the DQ case. And then you need to split the case that if there's some value, then you have to send it. So in this case, like we are just converting it to an option value in Rust. So if there's something, we, we send back some. And if there's nothing, then we just give back none. So this is the example that we have. So, and for the last five minutes, um, by the way, any questions for this, Jack Hugh? The only thing that's come up, um, and it's kind of an end of session thing, is that uh, Juan was asking if we can share the contents of the shared workspace on GitHub or somewhere else. And I'm sure it will come up if it hasn't, is that people would want to see your answers somewhere yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, sure, sure. I, I'll post the answer as well so that you can look at it. No immediate questions otherwise. OK. Yeah, so, um, so finally, we have this dining philosopher. And this is also taken from the, the paper here. The uh, manifest sharing, right? If you see, like, there's a th there's this section on dining for your software, and you can go and read it. Which basically uh, we have this uh, fork process that's represented as just a very simple set, very simple shared session type that you can just acquire it and then you release it later, right? It's kind of like a mutex. And then for each philosopher, you are given two forks. And then if you're familiar with the example, you just acquire the first acquire the left side and you acquire the right side. And then you spend some time eating it. And then after that, you release it, right? And this is the, so this is the example. So this is actually the, so this is how you actually implement it. So the fork is just this linear to shed. And then we have this philosoph philosopher process that is when given two shared channels, you just try and um, acquire it. So you can see like it acquires it and then you do some time eating, so it sleeps. And then after that, finally, you just release the fox, right? And then you continue. So, so this is a, actually, this is a process that actually does not terminate because uh, you just include the next copy of yourself and then you, you do this forever. You just keep eating, right? And then here we have our main session, which we just uh, try, which we just try to spawn a few philosophers and then we run it. And we can see one go here. Maybe I'll just go a few minutes over time. I'll go run the 10 dining philosopher line. So we just build this. And you can see like um, right now, it's actually stuck. Right? In this solution that I presented, it's actually stuck. And if you, you can actually look, look in the paper again to see like why it's stuck. And basically, you can see the answer is here. Right? The, the reason it's stuck is because like, the fork is given in the wrong order. And so like, eventually, there's a deadlock. And this is also the demonstration of like, why, we, that, why we cannot really guarantee deadlock freedom in Ferrite, right? because like, you can actually using shared session type, you can actually reach out, cause a deadlock like this. So to fix this, we follow the paper solution. So we just switch the place of the last pair of the fox for the philosopher tree, right? And then we just run it again. So now we will build the program. And you can see now, now the whole thing just continue, right? So it will just continue forever, it will just, the, the philosopher they will just um, takes turns to acquire the forks and then eat and then release it. So hopefully this is a, this is a example is clear enough for you to see how the shared session type works. Very cool. Uh, Prasanth has a quick question. Um, yeah. He says, uh, since we just incorporated session types into Rust, um, is it possible to incorporate dependent types in Rust as well? Not the full dependent types, unfortunately. Like um, the, the type system for Rust is still a bit more limited than like Haskell. So for some, a, a lot of the techniques, we, I, I actually have to use um, some workarounds or different, different ways to simulate the, the more advanced techniques that are already available. 